Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session WS06, Translation in the Times of COVID-19. Um, the pandemia has um, what is what you might call caused a formidable challenge for health system and societies as a whole around the world. And that of course has been affecting in many ways also um, the research and translation of medical knowledge um, into medical practice. Uh, we have put together a very um, wonderful uh, roster of speakers today um, that will shed some light on the challenges and re results of translation um, that we have seen um, in a very short period of time. Um, starting with uh, Patrice Debré from the Académie Nationale de Médecine, Ralf Heider from Charity Berlin and the National Programme, um, Jochen Roop from Bosch Health Healthcare Solutions and uh, Peter H. Seeberger from Max Planck Institute um, of Colloids and Interfaces. Um, and without much uh, further ado, um, I would like to introduce uh, the first speaker, um, um, Dr. Professor Dr. Patrice Debré, um, the spokesperson for the Academic Nationale de Medicine um, for pandemia related um, issues. Um, and uh, he is going to uh, present um, the challenges of creating uh, COVID uh, SARS 2 vaccines. Uh, Professor De Bray. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Okay. Okay, everyone see the screen? Okay, so um, uh, I'll try in a few slides to uh, show you the state of art of uh, development and challenge of uh, SARS-2 vaccines. Uh, to mitigate the public health and economic and social impacts, vaccines are urgently needed. Uh, and there are some notions to start. First, there is no vaccines that we know uh, against coronavirus for use in humans. Although there are two vaccines, against SARS-CoV-1, which have been until phase one and then stopped in 2004. And there are some vaccines against MERS-CoV which are actively developed. And those two experiments and series of experiments uh, show that some uh, antigeny targets are, are now uh, becoming quite clear. These targets are represented by the large surface protein encoded spike which is responsible for receptor binding and membrane fusion. And we know that antibodies against S, against spiked, and moreover against the receptor binding domain, prevent attachment and neutralize the virus. And these came the most antigeny targets, which are now uh, shown in, in most of the vaccines. Let's see now what are the immune response which are known in humans and non-human uh, uh, primate models. First of all, we know that during the immune response, which is induced by SARS-CoV-2 infection, the antibodies, which are both directed against S and against the RBD, and those antibodies are neutralizing. We can show that there is a plasma bad boost of antibodies, which is uh, followed by the decline. And moreover, that there is not only a, a general IgG response, uh, preceded by IgM, by the way, but there are also mucosal IgA response in the upper respiratory tract. Following this antibody response, the nose that there are cellular immunity, mostly represented by CD4 T cells uh, against uh, uh, S, and few, only few CD8 T cells against uh, the spike target. In the non human primate models, we know that SARS-CoV-2 infection prevents reinfection, and we know that neutralizing antibodies could be induced by vaccine, but that no T cell seems to be correlated for protection. 
Moreover, most in most models, um, vaccines are IM or ID, and then use therefore IgG, but no secretory uh, IgA. And this could indicate to us that these uh, vaccine uh, experiments and these vaccine candidates could prevent disease, but question the sterilizing immunity. In the traditional paradigm, an outbreak of vaccines, it takes uh, 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 around 15 years, in fact, to get the vaccines for use in humans. We start by exploratory, by development preclinical and tox, which takes usually two to four years. There is then a phase one to test the tolerance for two years. Then the immunocity, which stands for two other years, and then the efficiency for three years at the phase three. And then the biological license authorization is submitted to both FDA or MEA or at the national level. And then it takes five years to get a large scale production. For COVID-19 now, there are developing schemes with phase one two trials with rapid start of phase three trials after interim analysis of phase one two. And there is a commercial production without phase three results. However, global affairs starts us in January 2020, and vaccines in some countries like Russia and China, in fact, uh, seems to be used before tolerance uh, and phase three. And uh, one important thing to know is that the FDA guidance for now for development and licenses indicate that 50% efficiency seems to be required. Now, if we go to um, the candidates, there are now more than 170 candidates which are being used. And you can see that 10 are in phase one, 14 are in phase two, and uh, seven then in phase three. And I'll come back and I will come now to the technology which is used. So there are two sets of first technology on this side, shown on this slide, the DNA vaccines which in, in fact need an electric pulse to allow the DNA into the cells, DNA into the cells uh, uh, nucleus. And uh, uh, there is also mRNA, which is a uh, uh, lipid shell delivery. You can see on the back of the slides that some of these candidates are already in phase three. And I will name uh, Moderna, uh, which is an mRNA, and Pfizer's, which is an mRNA experiment, where Anges, Asaka University, and Takarabio are DNA and still in, in, uh, in phase two. The second type of experiments use either uh, uh, non-replicating or replicating viral vector. Considering the non-replicating viral vectors, we know uh, the chimp adenovirus from AstraZeneca. And there are also some uh, adenovirus like uh, Casino, which is adenovirus 25, like Gamalaya, which is a combinant 25 and 26 adenovirus, and like Janssen Pharmaceutical, which is a 26 adenovirus. These are the non-replicating viral vectors, but there are others. But these are the ones which are the more advanced. Now, considering the replicating viral vector, there is one with measles, uh, which in fact is all uh, coming from the Pasteur Institute and Temis, and now by, by Merck and which is uh, in, in experiment uh, process as well. Uh, another technical uh, possibility is related to virus like uh, particles or protein subunits. And there are some protein subunits like Novavax or, or, or the one of, uh, of Sanofi, which are uh, quite advanced in the, in the assay, but you can see that none of them reach at the, at the present time the, uh, the, stage, the phase, three, uh, phase three trial. Now, uh, last but not least, uh, there are the, uh, I would say, uh, historic uh, type of experiments with weakened virus or inactivated virus. And you can see that from uh, Beijing Institute of Biological Products or Sinopharm or Sinovac, some of these uh, uh, experiment candidates are already in, uh, in phase three. These are all the, the techniques. And I will come now to some of the challenge that the vaccines uh, um, uh, sh showed. First of all, uh, one should have in mind that we need two doses usually of vaccines and potentially a boost. And that will make 20, 17 billion doses which will be needed, needed. Also, as I've described other techniques, many of them are developed by entities 
that in fact never brought vaccine to market and by technologies that have been never in the science licensed vaccines. What also have in mind is that there are several bottlenecks with the ability of syringes and glass vials, and then questions to know how vaccine will be distributed globally and how the rollout will occur within a country. Also, as a challenge, uh, there, there are phase three which are needed to show effective, but not only effective, but also safe response. And one know that uh, in some models, including SARS-CoV-1 models, there have been these kind of enhancements uh, of the disease, mostly due, but not only by uh, enhanced uh, antibodies. So that in fact, uh, there are many speculations that neutralizing antibody could be protective, but no one knows if other factors, including uh, cellular immunity or even innate immunity might be needed. A point which I've shown and discussed previously is that only a sterilizing immunity can come through uh, the uh, by antibodies in the upper respiratory tract, which indicate that IgA production uh, might be needed, and if so, probably by intranatal uh, experiments. And and most of the experiments and most of the candidates are mostly I am uh, intramuscular or intradermically. A question also is the persistence. How long will the immunity stay? No one knows exact, exactly right now. And then if one come to uh, humans, um, we know that the immunity in elderly people uh, is usually lower and then probably prime boost would be needed. And then there are also questions about tolerance in young people. At the end, I would say that uh, distribution is a very important point and distributions need to go to the more needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Debris, um, the, for a very interesting presentation. Um, so far, uh, we haven't received uh, questions from um, the audience, which I would uh, like to cordially invite to post questions on the question and answer mode um, of, of, of the thread, um, if you like. But maybe I can go ahead and ask the first one. For, for your last point, how do you see the role of vaccinating in the risk population versus the general population. Um, obviously, um, the, the risk um, of, um, of uh, receiving the infection is uh, pretty much across the entire population, but there seem to be very defined risk groups uh, that have a much worse clinical course. And so obviously one uh, could be tempted to focus um, on uh, immunizing the risk groups first and foremost. Yeah, I, I, on that? Probably, I will probably follow the line which are uh, indicated by most governments and, and also by our academies, in fact, to try to first focus on, on, on the risk people, including the elderly people or comorbidities people or, 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 or poor people. That from the standpoint of the vaccine development, however, is a little bit difficult um, um, because, of course, the um, more mature immunity is probably less likely to be very responsive to, to, to some of the vaccines. Would you agree? That, 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 that's right. So we will see now how um, those uh, risk populations behave uh, when, when the vaccine will be there and, and what will be the results. And if they need, as I've shown, some uh, some boosting probably to, to try to enhance the, the immune response. Yeah, you, you pointed out that um, in, in fact, this development has been very quick and a lot of it has not been tested either because the organizations haven't done this before or even the methodology like in the nucleic acid um, vaccines um, um, has, has never been tested. Are you um, happy with the uh, types of progress that these projects have been making? Where where do you see further acceleration possible? Well, I think uh, we need uh, urgently vaccines. So uh, I would favor the idea that uh, we should try uh, different type of techniques, including those which have never been used before. Uh, and, and then I, I, I would have seen and we have seen that some of them are only in phase three and seems to give uh, some encouraging results. 
Now, no one knows how will be the competition with some other which seems beyond that, but, but still may have uh, an enhanced immune response better than the first ones. So that in fact, the type of presentation I'm doing today may change, I would say in a few weeks and a few months, in a few months in terms of uh, priority of the candidates, uh, which, which would be more useful for, uh, for use in, 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 into the populations we describe. Yes, do you see if prime boost is required that uh, different modalities might be might be used or do you think the uh, prime boost would be from one and the same vaccine um, always? Yeah, it could be what well, we have seen in the past for many vaccines uh, that in fact prime boost may use different type of vectors. Uh, and so that but it's also a possibility that uh, uh, there is a combination of the various vaccines, but no one now is really trying that. Uh, but that could be something which one has to, to have in mind for future, for future experiments, I would say. Yes, so thank you very much. I think we'll have um, ample opportunity to still discuss later and I hope you can uh, have the time to stay online with us. Um, thank sure. you very much for this uh, very um, great presentation and very thoughtful um, also analysis of what is going on. Uh, so we'll advance to the next speaker, which is Ralf Haider uh, from Charity. Uh, when Ralf uh, joined us from his uh, previous um, um, work as the leadership of the uh, German uh, academic medical centers in January, um, he, I think, um, as, as we all had a little idea what was waiting for us. Um, so he has been um, the mastermind of the uh, German um, COVID-19 research network that has been funded by the Ministry of Research in Germany. And um, um, it's um, quite uh, un unusual enough compared to um, previous networks of its kind that I think it really warrants a presentation on what is going on. Uh, Ralph, um, could, you, could you do us the honors? Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody can see my slides. Um, and um, yes. I would like to uh, use the opportunity and thank you for uh, inviting me today to give me the opportunity to talk a little bit about the German COVID-19 Research Network. Uh, that indeed is a uh, huge endeavor, which is a first in Germany in the way we are trying to set it up. And um, the question, is how does this research network fit into the current German um, medicine research landscape? And what you see here is the outline of um, all 36 German university medical, medical centers that are part of the research network. They are located uh, in 14 out of the 16 German federal states. Uh, the federal states are individually responsible for setting up and operating universities and university hospitals. Uh, and that is important to note um, that the federal government has no constitutional part or role in this. Um, therefore, so far, there has not been a joint research platform of all academic medical centers um, uh, on the federal level in Germany. The COVID-19 research network that we are currently trying to build is indeed the first attempt to create such a joint research platform, uh, which really every uh, university hospital is on board in, uh, on. The idea for creating such a network uh, actually dates back to March of this year. Um, Back then, the expectation was that around mid-April of this year, we would see that uh, intensive care capacities of many German university hospitals would reach the capacity limit. There were major concerns that that would uh, lead to um, medical research being severely affected in a negative way. Also, combined with the fact that we were um, back then um, right ahead of a lockdown situation like many other countries, which also meant that a lot of the research staff would not be able to um, use the research facilities. So um, that was one major concern. 
that medical research would suffer from shortage of staff and the lockdown conditions. And at the same time, we already saw a lot of fragmentation of COVID-19 related research activity. Just two examples on this. Back in March, we already had more than 80 uh, activities to create new COVID-19 registries. And we had about a dozen or more usually monocentric uh, studies on convalescent plasma that basically all ran independent of each other. That are just two examples. There are many more of um, how research activities um, intensified at a rapid pace, but at the same time with a lot of fragmentation. And the conclusion of uh, that policymakers came to at this point was that we needed to pool resources and coordinate uh, COVID-19 research in Germany in a much better fashion in order to use our scarce resources uh, in research uh, the most effective way. So the solution to this um, was that on March 26th, uh, the Federal Ministry of Research uh, published um, a 150 million euro uh, for one year budget to create the national uh, COVID-19 uh, research network and the project started in April. What is the mission? Uh, the mission basically revolves around focusing and coordinating um, COVID-19 uh, um, related research activities at a national uh, level. The network strives to do this by facilitating interdisciplinary collaboration, data sharing, which is a central aspect of the network, in fact, uh, the creation of platforms and promoting networking on all levels and across all issues, meaning that the uh, research network is not um, a traditional research funding organization, which does project-based research funding. It is basically a platform building. Uh, endeavor. Um, translation obviously is a major task of the network. However, this not only involves translation into patient care. Um, translation in the COVID-19 context means much more than that. In particular, also uh, means supporting pandemic management in a wider sense for example, by informing surveillance or public health strategies on the basis of new evidence or, for example, new testing options that are becoming available as research progresses. And lastly, um, the network is supposed to improve pandemic preparedness in the long run by building sustainable solutions, um, knowledge bases and infrastructures in order to be better prepared uh, for the future for similar um, um, occurrences. The governance of the project reflects the necessity uh, to act very fast. I showed you that the decision uh, to do uh, something about the situation happened mid-March. By the end of March, there was an announcement by the ministry and in April, we already started the project. So, um, this is reflected in the governance. The national task force uh, has been set up. It consists, among others, um, of the Federal Ministry of Health, the Federal Ministry of Research, um, four CEOs of large German academic medical centers, um, and two state representatives from federal states. Um, the, this national task force guides and accompanies the work of the national coordination office, uh, which is located in the Charité Berlin and which I have the honor of leading. Um, it is uh, this office that um, um, basically has been assigned the task um, and the role of coordinating this national um, effort. And the reason for this is that um, the conceptual um, ideas behind this um, network have originated um, in talks between the Charité leadership and representatives of government. Um, so basically, this office um, coordinates two different pillars of activity that are shown on this slide. On the left side, you see that there are 13 large collaborative projects, each of which um, has um, 
its own um, steering committee and uh, includes most or many of the 36 university medical centers. I will elaborate on those projects later. And uh, the second pillar here on the right um, is made up of 35 local task forces that are directly attached to the executive boards of the participating university medical centers. These local task forces collaborate with the coordination office in the Charité, primarily on the institutional level, for example, regarding legal and financial issues. And each local task force also coordinates for its site all projects that the respective university medical center is involved in. And as I mentioned before, every um, participating medical center is involved in more than one of these 13 projects. So what are these 13 projects that I have already mentioned on my slide before? Um, first, I would like to note that these 13 projects um, are either led or co-led by one or more um, of um, 15 um, university medical centers. So each of these 15 has the lead or co-lead in one or more uh, project. So this is really and truly a, a national and um, collaborative effort with many participating and leading uh, university medical centers involved. The uh, numbers that you see in brackets behind the respective projects is the number of participating university medical centers in each project. And you see this varies between uh, seven to nine on the lower end and up to um, 34 on the upper end. Um, no project involves therefore all 36 uh, network partners, but all projects include a large number of the university medical <laughs> center community in Germany. I would like to elaborate on a few things um, uh, regarding the projects. I don't have the time to go through all 13 of them, but um, a lot of those projects revolve around um, data acquisition, data collection, data gathering, and providing high quality data for the research community. Uh, this is, for example, true for the project number one, uh, the creation of a research data platform that is supposed to be available to integrate clinical data with biosample data and uh, radiology data uh, on a patient level. Uh, project number four um, creates a radiology data platform, which basically will allow to share on a national scope um, structured radiology data, for example, also to develop um, artificial intel intelligence algorithms on that platform. A similar endeavor is undertaken in research project number six, which is uh, doing a similar thing for uh, emergency care data. And in order to do so, we'll um, consolidate this data across the participating uh, university medical centers in a registry. And project number uh, Seven is also a remarkable um, endeavor. It's basically um, bringing together 27 university medical centers to create a joint autopsy registry. Uh, since we have seen that um, the, the knowledge we can derive from autopsies has brought a huge progress in better understanding the disease and its consequences. Um, Project number nine uh, is a really essential project um, to provide a very high-end uh, structured database. Uh, it's our cohort platform, which will par in particular um, create cohorts on deep phenotyping of patients uh, and thereby pro provide a, a very differentiated uh, structured database for further research. Other projects um, involve um, a focus on developing best practice for pandemic management in general. For example, project number 10 uh, is on surveillance and testing and trying to determine which testing strategies um, are the best uh, to perform surveillance in various settings, for example, nursing homes, daycares, schools, and so on. And of course, also monitor the progress of testing instruments and capacities in order to, to constantly adapt strategies to the, this evolution of technology. Um, 
project number 11, on the other hand, looks at pandemic management on a regional level, uh, basically on how to best bring together the various stakeholders on a regional level, for example, outpatient doctors, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, the local public health bodies, and so on, in order to collaborate uh, the best possible way to um, uh, improve patient outcomes and um, maintain pandemic um, preparedness. So these are just a few of the projects. Um, and um, if you have any questions of any of those projects in depth, please feel free to contact me anytime um, uh, after this presentation. On this slide, you see the number of projects that each individual university medical center participates in. And you see many of those um, centers participate in up to nine to 12 projects of the 13 I've just shown you. And what are the first conclusions after six months into the project? We have a very strong alignment um, of patient care and research in all of our project. And that proves to be essential in a pandemic situation in order to get fast translation going both ways, asking the right questions for research. And on the other hand, transporting research results into patient care decisions and into pandemic management quickly. Secondly, um, we have seen an unprecedented speed of implementation. Those 13 concepts uh, of large scale collaborative projects on a national level developed in just three months. Um, and furthermore, we also have seen um, that within this very short notice, a very strong interdisciplinary character of networking activities has evolved. Uh, we see a lot of new connections between uh, the participants on all levels. And actually, this is also something that is very actively communicated back to us as a big first success uh, by many PIs who really um, enjoy having these new connections and, um, and, and networking opportunities. And uh, this is exactly what we, were what we were hoping for when we were setting this up. So we are very pleased with how the project has evolved uh, to this point, And we hope to continue to see more of that. Um, and with this, I would like to conclude my remarks. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And please feel free to contact me anytime with questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Um, um, that is, um, in, in fact, a lot for just a few months. Um, and uh, certainly, um, as, as we said in the beginning, nobody is envying you for trying to herd all these cats and single-handedly um, uh, ba basically coordinate uh, um, the science across um, an entire country and, of course, also with the surrounding European uh, neighbors. Um, perhaps uh, my first question is that, direction, it's, it's not only a national network, but also, of course, a, a European and, and international endeavor. Could you briefly comment on the steps that the network is taking um, to, to make sure those connections are, are there um, as needed? Yes, on the outset for now, we have very much been focusing on um, pulling together the 36 German academic medical centers. So, so far on the macroscopic um, level of the network, we have not reached out on the international level yet. That will be one of the next steps to be undertaken once uh, we have finished setting up the national uh, network um, level. What we see, though, is that in some of the 13 projects, we already have a strong networking activity with the international community. For example, I have not mentioned this, but we have one project that strives for building up a um, uh, evidence-based medicine uh, ecosystem. And this effort is led by Cochrane, Germany, which is located at the University Hospital in Freiburg and has strong ties with the international Cochrane community um, in this project. And we, has, we see similar uh, outreach in, other, in others of the 13 projects. This is not solely a national endeavor, but indeed also a, a, an endeavor, especially on the level of the PIs, where a lot of um, integration and communication with international partners is going on. Yeah, as far as I understand, there's also a lot of emphasis on the um, exchangeability and interoperability of the data that is being collected. Um, at this point. 
Yes, one of the basic um, goals of the research data platform that I have briefly mentioned, it was project number one on my slide, is to um, make that data available in a database that operates on national uh, international standards like FHIR uh, to be able to exchange data with various stakeholders and amongst various um, uh, systems and databases. Um, so there is a strong link with the um, interoperability community also on the international level. However, I think this is something that will progress uh, over time. Uh, we will not be able to get all the data or make all the data available from the outset uh, in uh, coded in international standards. We have defined a core data set in Germany, uh, the Gecko, Gecko data set, which will be available from the outset um, uh, in, um, in, in international standards. But um, a lot of the other data we are starting out um, with um, will not be coded in FHIR or IEH compatible standards. From the outset, we are striving for that. We will eventually get there, but this will not be something that can be reached within a few months' notice. Uh, Professor Debris? Yeah, this is to, to extend, in fact, your remark uh, about the European level. You, you probably are aware that we have in France uh, a network dedicated to research whose name is uh, Reacting. And uh, I think that especially the program one could be. Uh, uh, it could be interesting to type to 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 discuss with reacting and to see how we can make networks of networks within the European community. I actually would love to to uh, exchange ideas on that. Um, so far, we have, for obvious reasons, been very focused on setting things up and uh, getting these activities going. Uh, but um, I think the the necessary uh, next step is to now reach out to the European community and see how we can link our activities with those of others in other countries. So if uh, it would be possible to get in touch on that, I would very much like to do so. So, so if you could send, send me your, your, your mail or, or mm -hmm. you, you, you can have my mail and, and then we could exchange on that, in, in that and see how we can, uh, we can discuss that further. Great, thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, support that contact as well if I can help any Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I understand you may have to move on and might not be able uh, to be present for the discussion or? Oh, I, I will be uh, available until the end of the session. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so the, the next um, and of course uh, um, also very important uh, point is, is the uh, question of how to get um, uh, the, the disease diagnosed in a pandemia. Um, of course, uh, medical, um, uh, staff uh, would wish they would have a point of care um, um, PCR that could be done bedside if needed um, or any other fast essay, but that can't be done. Uh, um, Jochen Rupp from uh, uh, Bosch, or can it? Well, um, with our solution, we can help to do that. And, and uh, thank you for the invitation again. Um, just a second, I will show you some slides. And uh, I was asked here by Professor Khalif to give a, a point of view from the industry side on scalable testing of SARS-CoV-2. Just a second now, you should see my slides. So, um, and my name is Jochen Rupp again, and I, I'm responsible for the SARS-CoV-2 test portfolio. And uh, I overlook the clinical performance of those tests. and. As you know, the industry provides uh, several tools for fighting COVID-19 and one of which is testing and as a common ground, this is the, the major pillar in identification of uh, infection sources and ultimately to avoid further spreading of the virus. And as uh, Professor Debris pointed out so well, this is going to be the strategy at least until we have a vaccine that is working well and is available in sufficient number. Um, and the problem here is scalability, um, to be able to test as many people um, as possible. 
And obviously, this is limited by the availability, the capacity, um, the time to result until you get your, your, um, your result. And the information is at the point where it's needed. And of course, the cost of the product themselves. So the strategy overall must be to test effectively. And one other thing is um, you don't know where the next outbreak might be and you need to be able to target hotspots uh, in time. So our solution from Bosch, of course, is our Bosch Vivalytic system. It is an easy to use point of care device um, with a gold standard PCR testing. You simply take a sample as you all know it from a, a throat swab or a nasopharyngeal swab, put it in uh, one of those test cartridges and start the test. And you get the result within uh, 39 minutes. And the information is given not within days, but minutes directly to the patient where it's needed. And you don't need costly and time consuming transport chains. And this overall reduces the time lag between testing and information at the point. So, and this lowers significantly the risk of further spreading during that time. So the main disadvantage of those kind of devices is the uh, testing capacity uh, or the test you can run simultaneously in one device, which you can see is, is one in this case. So what we came up with is um, a multi-scale solution for pooling samples up to five per, per cartridge. So imagine um, a nursing home visit from a family member, from family members. Um, in the entrance, there is a point of care device and you take a sample from each uh, five family members, for instance. You take the samples, pull them together and uh, start the test. And in this case, after 44 minutes, you know with the certainty of a, and the accuracy of the PCR test, whether all of those uh, tested people are negative or not. And this um, is very easy to use. And you can also uh, imagine if you have five people and only one test, the cost per person per test is very low and only a couple of euros. Um, and the other thing is that you can, um, with this, you can scale up, up to 50 or 60 persons per day uh, in this setting. And this can be uh, employees to see whether they are uh, allowed to go to work or should stay at home in home office. This could be uh, visitors or, uh, in this case, nursing home residents. And this point of care approach is not limited to this use cases. We also installed devices on cruise ships, for instance, for them to be able to continue their business. And this can be done in public areas such as schools as well or other industries. Um, and there are mobile solutions in development where you have several dozens of devices in trucks and you can um, go to hotspots whenever there is the need to go there and to increase the capacity uh, locally. So, and with this, um, we don't have, only have SARS-CoV-2 testing, but also other respiratory tract infection testing, for instance, influenza, so you can support the diagnostic process of a practitioner or a lab. So from our point of view, what needs to be done? Um, of course, the industry, uh, we as industry have to provide uh, enough PCR tests or enough tests to, um, to support the strategy and um, we are always working on faster and more cost-efficient solutions. But in times of COVID-19, one of the major challenges is to the supply chains itself. If you want to order um, PCR primers, for instance, that is a challenge of its own uh, nowadays. The second thing is uh, the legal boundaries. If you have a practitioner, mostly they 
are not certain if they are able or allowed to use those tests and if they get reimbursed for it. And the other thing is you need harmonized standards. We are all fighting the same virus in each and every country in every, every region, but there are very different um, ways to get the products there and to do the admission process and the registration. And that in the end um, has, a, has a huge time effect um, when and where such products are available, available for the patient. And last but not least, um, we need to streamline the information. And this has to be done by consequently implementing digitalization. There is no need, there's no use in more, more testing or faster testing if it takes two or three days um, for the information to get where it's needed, for, in, for instance, in a follow up of infection chains. And we need to, to connect devices, we need to connect the available information, um, for instance, for in one into warning apps and in our uh, devices have already the, the, tech, the technique for that, the technology for that um, with our connectivity solutions. So if we, if we test at a point of care with fast tests and good information um, um, flow, that is, in my opinion, the most effective way uh, to fight the disease. Okay, thank you very much um, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, th there are, of course, a number of questions that come up right away. Um, if you look at the current situation, um, it would, of course, be excellent if, um, as you say, the pooling situation could be um, done within uh, within the hour, if you wish. Um, you said thirty nine minutes. Um, the uh, the other question that, of course, arises is the sampling um, is often hard to self-perform or cannot be self-performed for the PCR assays because the swabbing um, occurs, um, if you wish, um, deep inside of the head. And it's also not a very pleasant experience for those of us who have gone through it already. Um, so the question is, um, do you think um, this assay would also lend itself to, you know, just nasal swabs or saliva, or can it eventually be um, turned into a self-administered uh, test, which um, would, of course, be um, also very useful with regards to uh, shielding staff uh, from potential infection and, and other organizational difficulties? Well, well, well it, comes to, it comes to sampling. Um, well, we simply follow the um, the uh, the standards that are done by RKI or the WHO. If there is enough evidence that you can test the saliva or nasal um, a nasal sample, that can be done by those tests as well. They are they have a um, standardized simple purification and PCR of a sample. So those those matrices from those um, from saliva, for instance, could be tested as well. The, the thing is, just because it works, it's not the same as you are able to sell it and to use it. You have to prove that this, it works and uh, that it works uh, in a standardized way. And from own experience, the sampling is, is quite a challenge. It, um, it's, it's very um, uncomfortable. Um, and when it comes to self-testing, um, there is there's two things you, you you need to do the sampling very well and in from our, my experience with uh, clinical partners and 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 doctors and practitioners this is where most um, well where most mistakes are made or the most um, failures occur if you don't do that right your result or the, the test can be as sensitive as it as it is it, it doesn't matter it, your result won't be the correct one. And that's why self-sampling is um, at least, well, we, ne we need to see if that really works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that. Um, you know, doctors are very bad patients. I know I won, so 
Um, absolutely. With the um, antigen tests uh, coming to the market also at a very significant, uh, a significantly lower price point, um, some of the PCR tests are charged for private patients at three-digit figures, um, whereas um, uh, the um, the antigen tests may, um, at least um, on the purchasing level, have a single-digit uh, uh, figure cost for 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 the large um, users. Um, I was wondering, um, can you say anything about where bedside or point of care PCR testing would fall in that realm? Um, actually, I can give you a, a, an estimate, but we just make the price in the second row because our distributors are free to, to sell um, the PCR tests and make the prices and they always, uh, well, that, that is a, an overall package you get with an um, a device and uh, the, the, the cartridges, but um, let's assume a very, very costly three digits. And uh, that, that's, well, that's not how, uh, how the market price is actually. But if you, if you use the pooling approach and divide those, those tests by five and you have, let's say 75 euros, you, you will come very close to the range of the antigen tests, uh, which are, as I, I know, about 10 euros or so, maybe below 10 euros. And the thing is, most clinicians I talk to, they are saying, um, we really want to use those antigen tests because they, they are really um, easy to use and, and they are even um, closer at the point of care. They don't need a, a device for that, but they always have the strategy to test, to make a follow-up test with a PCR anyway. So you need to, to align those two strategies. If you have an antigen test, you can, you can screen easily where, where no um, uh, lab equipment is available, but you always need to calculate the loss in sensitivity and the, the numbers of patients that might have or are positive and you do not detect. So that's, that's something you need to level out. And then you have, you, you said it, about the costs, you need to calculate what's what's the most efficient and cost efficient uh, strategy for that. But again, yeah, if, but... You, if you if you calculate the, um, the the transport costs, the transport chain, the different the different stages until the the sample really is analyzed and the information is back uh, to the patient, if you can cut that out, it's it's really time saving and more cost efficient. Yes, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, with regards to the, the scalability, um, if this would become a new standard, is it, is it possible to scale it rapidly or are there bottlenecks in, in, in terms of the production um, that, that you see um, if this got adopted um, on a fairly quickly quick basis? Well, um... We have adopted and we have increased our plan five times as initially before COVID-19, uh, before the, the pandemic occurs, we have uh, increased our capacity five fold and we will try to do to continue this next year as well. And um, but you there is a there is a limit to that um, how much you can go up and uh, in what time and with uh, the production of such a device and such a cartridge, they are highly mass producible, um, but the, the, the test needs in terms of, of numbers in the world is, is that high that no single um, um, company can compensate that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, but uh, thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, so thank you very much again for a very interesting presentation. Um, we now come last but not least to Professor Peter Seeberger from the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces in Potsdam. Um, he is um, also um, a very world-renowned scientist um, in uh, chemistry and biochemistry um, in, 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 with a lot of different activities. Um, I um, uh, would suggest uh, you look up his CV that um, has been put um, on the uh, uh, 
for, uh, on the uh, uh, summit website, just like uh, the ones of the other speakers here in this session. Um, it's quite impressive. Um, he is going to talk to us about a, a very um, a quite unusual approach, or um, or maybe not so unusual, the evaluation of artesanate and um, artemisia annua extracts that fight SARS-CoV-2, and then some other um, approaches from his perspective um, to, to dealing with the pandemia. Um, Professor Seelberger. Kalle, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Um, I will talk about uh, two different uh, projects, um, looking at um, preventing drug shortages and uh, the development of new um, therapeutics. Before I do that, I have to disclose here that I'm directly or indirectly um, financially involved in spin-off companies that are discussed here. In this presentation, a presentation by no means is intended to promote any of the products or the companies, but uses them only as examples for the translation of research results. So that is, I think, uh, very important to say beforehand. Um, I work for Max Planck Society. The Max Planck Society was um, started in 1948, and Max Planck once said, knowledge must um, precede application. So my job is not really at all uh, to translate or to create companies or any of that, of that stuff, but um, sometimes some very simple things we invent may have some uh, major impact down the road. And um, a very simple thing I'll tell you about today in two different vignettes has to do with the production of pharmaceuticals. Um, most mass produced items today, and that even involves cars, are made by, by processes that are more or less continuous. Very few things are made in batch. In the cars, it's Ferraris that are made in batch and many people, including me, can't afford them for that reason. But pharmaceuticals amongst the few things are still made in batch processes. Um, and that is one of the reasons why pharmaceuticals can be actually quite costly. The last few years, there have been changes people thinking about making uh, drugs also in a continuous way. And I've worked on this um, for the past um, 20 years. Um, just this year, we published uh, a paper in Nature where we um, showed that you can actually have a conceptually new way to automatically synthesize quite complex chemical compounds with what's called a radial synthesizer. And don't worry what it means, but it basically means you can make small quantities, also larger quantities of compounds very quickly, analyze them, and do all that in a remote or automated fashion. This means I could now from my home run a synthesizer anywhere in the world and that synthesizer would make um, chemicals for me. Um, that was patented and it was all done prior to the COVID-19 crisis. But it turns out this approach actually uh, may become very important to address the shortages in essential medicines. Because what you can do with such an approach is you can produce on site so the active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, can be made in location. They can be made on demand. I'm not suggesting you're gonna make the entire supply of all drugs everywhere in the world on demand, but you can basically take the sort of um, spikes in demand um, using such um, approaches. And you can actually franchise that sort of system, think along the lines of hamburgers being made at McDonald's, always taste the same anywhere in the world, made by a exactly the same a process with the same quality and quantity. And that is really the way we think about the production of uh, generic medicines in a local way. That means you can st start thinking about now making your drugs where they are needed. Today, most of generic drugs are made in either India or China. In the United States, for example, 80% of the drug substances are actually produced in China. And you can imagine there are certain problems if there are um, trade wars that all of a sudden you find yourself without essential drugs. So with the process that was developed here, you can actually um, implement that on the same site. You have a continuous process that can be scaled from small to very large without changing any of the production um, processes and you're condensing the entire value chain um, and you can do that at any location you wish to do that. So any country needing a certain drug can do that. And um, we're working in this in just showing of the um, 100 most important or most essential medicines of the WHO list, where this could be done. We picked pregabalin, an epilepsy drug, gabapentin, an anticonvalescent, a baclofen, a muscle um, relaxant for this. But once the um, pandemic started, we also included paracetamol 
I would usually not do that because that's actually for chemists <laughs> actually too easy to make. Um, but it turned out even during the high time of COVID in Germany, it was at some point there were shortages for paracetamol. So that can be made quite easily in the device. We made um, mifedipine. This is a um, high blood pressure uh, medication that was also in a short um, supply in Germany. And we made a local anesthetic um, lidocaine that is actually was in shortage in North America. So all these things um, can be made and um, they have now been um, translated uh, into a um, company called Franchise Pharmaceuticals that is being um, funded and has been started in Germany with a goal to actually try to make local production of drugs possible. And I can tell you the idea was around for a long time, but it never would have happened without COVID-19 because COVID-19, the pandemic showed the real frail situation in um, our supply chain um, on the drug side. And now, of course, there's a real interest in making sure the emergency supplies of these drugs are always guaranteed. Um, the second project I'd like to introduce to you also builds from the same concept of continuous chemistry, but it goes down to a much deeper level of chemistry. And I'm sorry, I can't spare you all the details, but it shows that at Max Planck, we sometimes work on very esoteric things. So my interest really was to take oxygen that we all breathe all the time, we call that triple oxygen. And all I wanted to do is I want to put energy from light in the molecule and I turn around on electron because that gets me to the excited state of oxygen we call singlet oxygen. And singlet oxygen is a very green and cheap oxidizing reagent. The problem with it is that it's very unstable. It has to be made directly off the site um, where it's going to be used afterwards. And that's why it's really not been used at all in industry. And that's what we wanted to do. About 10 years ago, uh, we figured out a way of how to do that. And by complete coincidence, which has kind of become uh, clear maybe in the next slide, we came into a project uh, that had to do with healthcare and drugs. And that particular project revolved around a drug that's called artemisinin. And artemisinin is extracted today in about 250 tons per year from the um, plant, sweet wormwood, in German, Bifus, Artemisiano Einjäger Bifus. And it's traditionally used in Chinese medicine, but also by many other traditional medicines. It's quite easily scalable. It's used today as a frontline drug against malaria, always as a combination therapy um, with other drugs. And over 100 million patients get this drug every year. It has very few, if any, side effects. And it's used also actually in neonates and very small children. The problem is that the global demand today for this drug outstrips the supplies. So about 50% of this drug used in Africa is actually fake and many people die unnecessarily. So um, we came to this whole thing because we realized that uh, you can actually take um, extracts from, from uh, the plant, Artemisia annua, that contains a biosynthetic precursor that's thrown away as waste. So every, every kilo of artemisinin, one kilo of a molecule shown in the middle of the screen here, dihydroartemisinin is thrown away. And so we figured out as a way to basically take this material, just dissolve a plant, what you're gonna get is a green goo that includes chlorophyll. And then you pump that green goo through a um, continuous device consisting of a clear uh, plastic tubing. You add some um, compressed air and you push this whole thing through. You can make from air, from plant waste and from light, uh, you can make a drug artemisinin. Uh, in large quantities. Almost sounds too good to be true, but it's actually not. It was a patented process and there was a company um, formed trying to actually produce affordable malaria drugs. But for many reasons, uh, people apparently weren't so interested in that. Uh, and that has more to do with um, business reasons rather than with global health, because as I said, the world does need um, a good access to um, artemisinin as a basis for drugs. So um, this process was there. We were interested in this molecule and it turns out actually that this molecule, artemisinin, is not just working against malaria. It has also been shown to work in a wide variety of other diseases, including um, arteriosclerosis, schistosomiasis, viral infections, I'll get to that in a second, but also it works against many, many cancers. That's mainly a work of press effort from Mainz University. There have been a number of very successful human clinical trials. Uh, and so um, the company in Potsdam eventually started another company in the United States, which I'm no longer directly involved. And Artemi Life said, okay, we would like to develop these drugs against cancer. And they were in the process of actually starting human clinical trials in the United States 
when the COVID pandemic hit um, the world. And at that stage, it was clear that people had been interested in using extracts from Artemisia anno as well as pure substances to fight against other SARS coronaviruses. So it was a paper in 2005 that had been shown these extracts were actually quite powerful against SARS CoV-1. So the idea was when to say, okay, if it works against SARS CoV-1, maybe it also works against SARS CoV-2 that we have here. So the only access for our institute at the time was to get um, the plant substances sent from the United States to us. We did the extractions, both aqueous and um, ethanolic extracts, but also we used known antimalarial drugs, namely artesanate, compound number two that's in Sanofi's drug, as well as Artemisia that's in the Novartis um, drug. And then we collaborated with virologists at the Free University of Berlin and the, in, in Copenhagen at the hospital. And they then started doing um, the assays. I'm sorry, the data is very small here, but basically you learn from that. If you take two different viral isolates, you can take two different types of cells in two different laboratories, all blinded. What they found is that our tessinate, the Sanofi drug, was most powerful, more powerful than plant extracts or artemisin or um, artemifa against sars cov virus 2. Those data were actually so promising that um, a group in the United States developed a clinical trial protocol for a phase one, phase two clinical trial. And um, they shared that clinical trial protocol freely with others around the globe. And because the FDA had some questions back and forth, actually the clinical trial started first um, at the National Institute of Health, Science and Nutrition in Mexico City. And they have now a six center human clinical trial with 360 patients ongoing for the past three weeks. And the University of Kentucky is going to start their trial probably the next couple of weeks now with some delay. They're going to have actually different arms looking at pure substances, artesanate, teas, and other drugs in comparison. That's going to start, as I said, quite soon with 60 patients in each arm. So there were a number of lessons we learned during this uh, COVID pandemic. One thing we knew before that sometimes groundbreaking research can actually help solve real life uh, problems. You saw here very simple ideas can maybe help sometimes. I think for our policymakers, what's important is that sometimes they think basic research shouldn't be funded. I think eventually it does pay off in one way or another. Um, the problem we have sometimes is to get past preconceived notions and structures. And oftentimes, particularly in Germany, commercial uh, interests of scientists such as myself and others are viewed with a great suspicion. For me, coming from the United States originally, where I was educated, um, this is a little less of an issue in some other countries. With that, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting um, uh, presentation. Um, in fact, you have been addressing two major problems that have become very apparent in this uh, pandemia. Um, if I may just um, add a quick question, um, you know, of course, I can understand where, um, you know, the broad spectrum of biological activities that is um, claimed and or known for this substance raises um, some alarms in uh, uh, scientists that uh, usually the experiences that they then don't work as well um, in real life. Uh, um, but um, I was wondering, uh, when should we be able to, um, so this is being tested in patients who have an infection at an early stage uh, or yes. at, a, at a later yeah. stage, or when, when should we be expecting um, results from these trials? So um, the trials are set up in such a way that you have people with a mild infection early on, just after diagnosis that you give that. Um, and um, they should have at least one additional factor, obesity being one or other um, indications. So these are patients that are taken into the trials. Um, the trial takes uh, two weeks of giving the uh, medication and then follow up for two weeks. Um, the first patients were recruited in Mexico three weeks ago. And just before the talk, I tried to get the latest numbers. Unfortunately, they didn't get back to me. So I don't have them yet, but actually they should have uh, officially, they say January, but they have such high patient numbers, they should give a data um, earlier, but that's out of my hands. Um, mm -hmm. In the US, they're going to start probably the next uh, 10 days or so. Uh, again, the patient numbers are high, and um, in that case, enrollment should be uh, pretty quick, but that's always uh, difficult to tell. So these are positive patients with risk, fa risk factors, then, that you will seek the application. Exactly. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's not Next. something we really want to give to people that are intensive care unit, obviously. Um, I think this is something early on during infection. 
No, the, uh, the mechanism of action is, is directly related to the replication of the virus, if I understood so um, your No, I think um, this is one of the things so I come from, I'm a chemist, okay, so I come from a different angle. And when I first got into this field eight years ago, I was extremely skeptical because you look at this and apparently it, it cures everything, right? So that made me very nervous uh, from the get-go. Uh, I thought, well, that's yes. all probably nonsense, right? Uh, it turns out the exact mechanism of action uh, in most of those applications is not known. Um, and you can have huge fights for a long time. And some people say, well, um, it's immunomodulation. Others say, well, there are specific effects. I think uh, there are multiple compounds in the extracts. Um, and even our testonate itself has probably multiple modes of attack. So there is clearly some um, replication inhibition going on here. And that is all we tested in the viral cells because viral cells, there is no cytokine signaling, so you don't see anything else. So clearly there's some antiviral activity. It is about tenfold um, less than remdesivir, but where in humans, people believe there are additional activities such as immunomodulation. I know that's a horrible thing. People always, I always worry about that because it sounds a little shady, um, but funny enough, although so many people get these drugs, the mode of action is not really known in detail. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to open the more general discussion um, among the, the presenters, um, especially, we also have a, a question from uh, uh, the, the, uh, our listeners, um, um, and that is uh, to Professor Debray, but probably also uh, to, um, uh, to the other participants. Um, the, the immune response um, um, could or should also be a cellular immune response um, for protection. Um, what do you think? Um, do you think that the expected efficacy of inactivated or subunit vaccine my, vaccines might be influenced by uh, the types of immune responses that you can usually elicit? Um, yeah, yeah. We, we, we usually see in the experiments a relationship between uh, the antibody response and mostly neutralizing capacity of these antibodies to, to, to prevent uh, to prevent the disease. Now, no one knows exactly if a cellular immune response, or even if an innate immunity could be also of interest. Uh, this has been untested. Um, another point concerning immune response, which I've talked about also, is the fact that most of the vaccine candidates do induce IgG antibody response and not IgA antibody response, which is acting on the upper respiratory tract and would be their sterilizing uh, immunity, um, although the IgG might uh, be also only presenting the disease and not possibly the transmission of, uh, of, of the virus. But there are still uh, many unknown responses uh, from, from those, um, I would say, preliminary results which have been obtained either in non-human primates or, or, in, or in human, and much should be known uh, about uh, the immunity. Now, which I've also mentioned in my talk is that the immune response seems to be correlated to uh, CD4, c cellular immunity, uh, in terms of, uh, of protection more than CD8. Mm -hmm. that, that is obviously um, very important to know. Um, interestingly, there isn't that much uh, of, of viremia um, if I understand it uh, correctly. Um, and so the protection um, in the beginning could almost be local. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, 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 would, um, I would think that protection would work. Uh, I, I, I would rather think that any type of vaccine which would try to enhance IgA immune response, which is the early event in the respiratory tract, would be of major interest. But most of the candidates now are focusing on the IgG response, as I said, and, and probably other ways of, uh, of prevention like intranasal uh, immunizations would be helpful. But just a few candidates are, are looking to that possibility right now. 
where do you see the role of antivirals and of interfering with replication? Um, because it seems that even the sickest patients at the time that they go into lung failure have uh, sufficient amounts of antibodies, even of neutralizing antibodies, and then um, are oftentimes more affected by um, a, a, a too, um, uh, too extensive immune reaction affecting their pulmonary and other tissues. Um, so um, the question really could also become, can we buy the organism time to mount a more sufficient immune response before being overrun by the virus? Um, is, is that something that you feel is worth consideration? Yeah, I think it is, it is important to consider that. Uh, and this, uh, again, I think we will learn much more in, 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 in studying the, the, the details of those uh, immune response uh, uh, which are uh, generated by, by those vaccines candidates and uh, we know exactly probably more how they will work or could work and how we could modify things. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with regards to those questions, uh, Ralph Heider, the, the, do you think the networks that are trying to characterize patients should or would and will also have a focus on vaccinated uh, patients or vaccinated individuals that don't have um, um, actual disease? Well, for, first of all, I would uh, like to point out I'm not a, a doctor or a natural scientist by training. So um, I can only look at the projects and what their scope is and uh, speculate to some extent. Um, we have one focused project on um, immunology that definitely uh, addresses some of the questions that have been brought up in the discussion um, as to how um, immunology um, comes into place and also how it can be transferred amongst um, patients or uh, people. Um, I also think that the large cohorts that we are about to set up uh, and that uh, will uh, will um, do deep phenotyping of patients would eventually be able to look at the effects um, of immunization on the progress of illness. Uh, but that to some extent is speculation by someone who is, as I said, not, not a doctor or a natural scientist by training, but I definitely think that the, the projects, the, the cohort studies and the databases that we are planning to create should be able to help answering some of those questions. If I may, if I may go, uh, also I've seen that you have something interesting. You have a program on autopsies, and that I think is important because if you look to the immune cells uh, in patients which are dying, that's probably will worth and 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 will tell us uh, what's going to happen in those in those patients. Because to come back to vaccines, we we in fact should know that there are two types of vaccines. There are vaccines which inhibit the transmission of the virus, and there are vaccines also which are against the disease, like, for example, in, in diphtheria or, or tetanus. The vaccines is not directed against the pathogens, but against the, the toxicity of the pathogens. So in knowing better through the autopsies in your programs, not only in, in an overall immune response, but also directly in the tissues, you might know better uh, what type of immune response or which are the defects of the immunity which are relevant for the type of disease. Yeah, I find, I find that very striking that uh, the, 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 one of the best predictors of a, of a bad or serious clinical course is the lymphopenia that patients develop at the very beginning. Um, I was wondering whether you had any thoughts on that. Well, there are two different possibilities. It, 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 Either the, the lymphocytes go into the tissues, and you might find them find them in in, in, in those tissues, or uh, they are destroyed. And you have to understand why they are destroyed. Are they destroyed by the virus? Are they destroyed by uh, by inflammatory process? Uh, we, we don't know exactly. That's uh, very interesting that the, that these things. Um... Um, still need to be developed, and we actually have to go all the way back to the drawing board um, on, on, on that. So um, for all of the uh, participants, in, in order to action on 
the things that you have just proposed, um, obviously we are running into a second wave, if you wish, or a continued first wave of infections um, in many of the countries around the world. So I was wondering in terms of accelerating the translation um, what it is, what are you going to be your next step um, in order to address these problems? Perhaps we can go around, starting with Jochen Rupp, maybe. Well, um, our next steps, um, as, as I said, we, we need to, to use the, thing, the things we already implemented in a, in a better way and in a more efficient way. I, um, I think there is no use in, in, in testing all the time everybody that it needs to have, um, it needs to make sense when on and who to, te to test. And um, again, I, I have some, some uh, scenarios from or some, some effects from the, from the uh, outbreak um, where the, the the time is so long until you get your results. Sometimes it's been five or six or seven days that needs to be uh, made better. And um, I think we need to, to do more over digital um, solutions, less and less paperwork and facts. Yeah, and maybe I, uh, one question uh, to Mr. Haider. Um, I was I was wondering. Um, you, you mentioned databases for your, all your projects, and I can imagine that this is a, a huge challenge to um, synchronize all these information. And I, I was wondering if what what is the, the the main challenge to get this information done? You, you mentioned that it is a, a huge problem even within Germany to get uh, standardized information exchange. Uh, I, I can respond directly to that. Um, there are several large challenges. The first one is uh, the readiness of the individual, individual institution to share its data. Obviously, that, that is often a big barrier um, to collaboration. Um, secondly, we have the problem of data protection issues as soon as you would like to share data across institutions, uh, which also requires patient consent that you, you need to uh, acquire beforehand. Thirdly, we don't have IT platforms that uh, are ready to, to integrate data across various institutions uh, ready at hand. Uh, some of those platforms still need to be built. Um, and I think lastly, we have the issue that Professor von Kalle briefly addressed earlier. Even if we have data, it's often not good data because it's not standardized data, it's not structured data. Um, and uh, therefore, um, um, the same things are often coded differently across different institutions, which make them, uh, which limit their usability for, for, for research. So I think those four challenges are the ones that we need to, to, to address. Um, we will for sure not not be able to to solve all of these issues perfectly within just a few months, but I have seen more progress of some, on some of those issues in the last three months than I have seen in the years before. So I'm very confident that we will be able to um, get quite a bit ahead. Yeah. I Does think that answer I, your question? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think I, I, we see the a similar um, uh, thing in the in the clinical setting and in the practitioner setting, there is an, a more open-minded um, standpoint regard, with regards to digitalization. Um, everybody sees that the, they are overrun by the, the, the tasks to do it during the pandemic and that uh, connectivity solutions really help, help them to get uh, the things done. Well, yes. If, if I might, may just add to the question of Professor von Kalle, what, what um, are the next steps? Um, um, as I mentioned, what we are trying to do is basically a pilot uh, within Germany by uh, connecting all of the academic medical centers the way we are trying to do. Um, I think 
looking at this more from a regulatory and organizational perspective, the big question will be to, to look at what mechanisms, what incentives, what project designs work, which ones really instill and um, facilitate collaboration and data sharing, and which don't. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sure as with any effort of that scale, you will see some things that go extremely well and others that don't go as well. And so I think the basic challenge will be to quickly realize what institutional arrangements, what incentives, um, what project designs um, are successful and then roll those out even further and adjust the ones that don't work as well. I think that's basically from my perspective, the main task ahead for the next 10 to 12 months. Yes, same question to Peter Seeberger. What do you see, see as the obstacles? Can the network or any of the other things we discussed help you in getting the drug on the road and, and then to Europe? So our um, challenges were early on to get access to virologists. It turns out the Max Planck Society has no virologists. I think we need to change that. Um, I um, think the virologists are, of course, um, very hardworking right now in their limits. Um, the second thing was we wanted to originally test the drug in Germany, um, but at the time when we had the first test results, there was no, luckily, no SARS coronavirus alone in Germany anymore. So we wouldn't have got the numbers, and that's why we went to Mexico and the US, just because they had the numbers. So we have reached out again to people in Germany, and also we are discussing right now with people in Africa and South America. But I think that is all uh, dependent upon the results of these first clinical trials now. So I think we're right now in a wait and see period, and then we're gonna push it forward if it actually turns out to be promising. Yes, there has been one additional question from the floor that I've just seen, Professor Debray. Um, what about the, uh, is there any risk of aggravation um, from people who undergo vaccination or other types of treatments? Um, I think there is, um, there is always the, uh, the question of antibody dependent uh, facilita uh, facilitation of the cellular infection. Um, do you see that as a real possibility? And, and uh, what about other side effects? Um, well, well th this is something we should be considered especially because there have been in SARS-CoV-1 some example of enhancements of disease, but uh, they have not seen in non-human non, non -human private models, uh, or even into humans, there is no case reported which would indicate that there could be such. Now, if there are such, one has to also understand what would be the mechanism. Antibody enhancements is, is one thing, but there are mid other possibilities which are unknown and which would be related, for example, to, to, to cellular immunity as well. So um, to resume that, I would say that uh, this is something what should have in mind and we should be overlooked into the phase three trials. Uh, but until now, there is no case reported uh, which would indicate that uh, that should be the case. Yes, um, it, it seems as though the follow-up of the um, clinical events, um, not only the infections, but the tracking of the patients and their, uh, and, and their fate in real life. Um, so the data questions that the network and the clinical trials are trying to address, um, as well as the longer term follow-up um, should, should be very important. So uh, there seems to be a, a strong digital component, if you wish, um, to what we need to do in the future, which is, I think, um, probably uh, an element that, that all of us um, are seeing. Um, I think we are coming to the end of our session. Um, I thought it was a very instructive uh, um, discussion on the um, translation um, in the times of COVID. I would like to thank the participants as well as the listeners um, uh, for, for their input. Um, and um, I uh, would wish to all of the participants, um, first of all, of course, good health, um, all the success to you with what you are trying to do. Um, and I hope uh, we can um, um, at the next uh, World Health Summit uh, have a similar session, session um, that is more of a lessons learned rather than a still an ongoing pandemia. Um, um, I'll keep fingers crossed. And again, um, I'll thank you very much um, and, uh, and wish you a, um, a pleasant rest of the Sunday. 
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.